apocalyptic grace. That will make more sense as we go on this morning. So, okay. Last week, we set sail into the dangerous waters of Romans 7. Treacherous seas they can be, because if you don't know how to navigate those waters correctly, you could uh, shipwreck into some really bad theology. But if you know how to traverse the channels and the waters of Romans 7, there'd be treasure there. There's a lot of treasure. And we began to look at that treasure last week. Romans 7, we found, is a, basically a, like a, a Paul the Apostle giving you what it's like to live under the law. He's expressing it in the first person, speaking as one who's living in bondage still to legalism. And we found that living under the law, living under legalism means living by a spirit of fear and by self-effort and all that kind of stuff. And that's what really increases sin and all of that in our lives. So um, at the end, Paul says, who's going to deliver me from this? Who's going to deliver me? And he goes back to his main point from Romans chapter 6, where he says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. But then he's going to wrap up his thought to bring us into Romans 8, okay? He's going to wrap up his thought, and then this one last time, he's going to speak in the first person as one who is under the law, and this is going to then usher him into his main point in Romans 8. So he says, so then, on the one hand... I myself, he's not telling you why he's thankful yet. He's still explaining what it's like under the law. Thanks be to God. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh, the law of sin. Okay. That's his final statement. And with that, Romans 8 comes in with a hammer. And he says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Can I get like a hallelujah in this Pentecostal church? It's, it's a little like hand, hand like shaking, Holy Ghost. Come on, Laura, you want to do a little dance for us or something? Come on. It's, like, it's exciting. Oh, Jesus. So, um, okay, if you don't get it yet, you'll get it. Don't worry. Just say it. I'll get it. Speak it out loud. Speak it by faith. You're going to get it. Okay, so um, he's going back to Romans 6. He's going back to like what he was opening up. And, um, and then he's going to take us from here into what some people have called uh, the Mount Everest of the Bible, Romans 8, okay? Like some of the highest revelation ever, ever given to mankind is found in Revelation, I mean, in, in Romans, well, Revelation 2, but Romans chapter 8. And, um, and so I'm excited to go there. But I want to stay at the base camp for a moment, okay? We're on base. You know, when you, when, if you've seen documentaries about going to Everest, there's a base camp that you have to get to first and unpack and repack and get ready to, to make the ascent. Okay, so we're at base camp right now. We're going to stay there for a little bit, verses 1 and 2. And then from here, we're going to travel up further into the heights of, of what's revealed in, in Romans 8. Okay, so he says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Okay, we're no longer under this, um, this thing. Like, with my mind, I'm serving the law of God, but with my flesh, the law of sin. Because in Romans 6, we learned that we were crucified with Christ. Sin was put to death. It's done. It's finished. Now we're no longer under the law. So there's no condemnation now. So you live in a permanent state of no condemnation. Do you, do you want to think about that for a moment before you respond? Um, there... You, you, there, you live in a permanent home, permanent residency of no condemnation. Okay. Um, you can never be condemned, okay? Like, no matter what. No matter what. You can't be condemned. What does condemn mean? Okay, in the definition, in the Greek dictionary for the word that Paul's using, they define it as a damnatory sentence. You can't be sentenced to damnation. You can't be sentenced to destruction. You can't be sentenced to punishment. Okay? You can't by God, right? Now, the devil can condemn you and try to accuse you and all that stuff and get you to think that God's condemning you. People can condemn you, but you are under no condemnation before heaven, which is really the only opinion that really matters. There's no condemnation anymore. It's impossible to be condemned for anything. Now, wow, okay, Statements like this is what got Paul in trouble. Got Paul in a lot of trouble. 
And he was accused very often because of statements like this of saying that he was giving people a license to sin, an okay to sin. Now, if you just read Romans 7, you would discover that actually the law empowers you to sin. The law gives you a license. And it puts, actually it puts fuel in your tank as well and everything else. The law and fear is what empowers you to sin, not grace. But anyway, people would accuse him of saying that he was excusing sin. And listen carefully to what I'm about to say here. People who teach grace correctly will, at one point or another, be accused of the same thing. I'll go so far as to say it like this. If a pastor or a teacher or a prophet or an apostle or whoever has not been accused of that in their ministry of the word, you have to question the gospel they're teaching. Like the gospel has to be so extreme, so radical and pure that it can actually make religious minds think that you are saying it's okay to sin, even though that's not what you're saying. You guys understand what I mean by this? Okay, like Paul already addressed this back in Romans 6. Okay, I got to go back in time for a moment. Um, you remember this. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? This is Paul anticipating the question because he would travel all across the world and he would get, people would ask him this. So he's like, let me just put it in the letter before anybody says anything. Let me just get this out of the way. Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? No, dummy. It's not what I'm saying. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Like, okay, the other part of the grace message here is that you're not a sinner anymore, okay? That's the complete picture. That's the, that's the other side of the coin, and we went on that side of the coin last week big time, and we looked at that, and we, we talk about that side all the time. However, we have to understand, before we get to this point, before we get to the obvious, like, no, it's not an empowerment to sin, um, we have to first stay in the radical revelation of grace that, that God's grace is with you no matter what. We got to let the scandal of that hit our hearts. We have to get this first, that God's grace is going to meet you no matter what's going on, no matter what's happening, that God's grace is there. If by deception you fall into some bondage, God is going to meet you there, not with condemnation, but with love. That's how safe you are. You know, a lot of us, you know, can, can, can imagine ourselves being safe from the devil, maybe, because of, you know, God's with us. But some of us can't imagine being safe from ourselves. Like, we can understand safety and trust, like God will always protect me, up to this point, though. And so at the end of the day, there is still something on me that I need to do in order to stay in the boundary line of God's love and blessing and protection. It's not the case. You are covered no matter what. And I know that's scandalous, but, but it's the truth. It's the gospel and I won't water it down. People think that watering down the word means like preaching grace. It's so sad. They think watering down the word is preaching grace. Like watering down the word is preaching fear and law and doom and gloom. That's the water. Don't get me started, Denise. <sighs> so I've already covered this enough. You guys know. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? We, are, we already went there. Um, but I, I do. All right. I want to I talk about the story of the woman caught in adultery. John chapter 8. Okay. You all familiar with this story? All right. Um, this might be one of the best pictures of Romans 8, 1, verse 1, and verse 2, um, as far as what it's communicating. So there's a story. Jesus is just doing his thing as he normally would be out on the streets of, of uh, Jerusalem or whatever village he was in at the time. I think he was in Jerusalem at this point. And, um, and he's kind of just mind his own business at this point. He's just, he, he's not teaching or speaking publicly. Um, but a group of religious leaders bring a woman to him that was caught in the act of adultery. Okay, I, I personally believe a lot of other people uh, think this, and there's, there's some, you know, so, some circumstantial evidence that, that the person that she was sleeping with was actually a member of the Sanhedrin. 
that this was a setup, which is really sick, if that's the case. Um, that the Sanhedrin, that's the religious leadership, they wanted to catch Jesus in the act, and they had something set up for this um, because they knew they needed to trap him on the law. They knew if they could make him contradict the law of Moses, they, could, they, they might be able to, you know, so, so this was like a really powerful way to do that. Okay, so they catch this woman in the act. You don't see the man anywhere, right? Um, yeah, it's just the woman. They drag her to Jesus. And what do they want to do? And, and obviously she's in the wrong as well. Um, but the law wants to accuse her, right? They, they want to bring death to her. Literally, they want to stone her. They say, Jesus, the law says that we're to stone this woman, right? And that's what the law does. It brings death. It does not bring life. This is what Romans 7 is all about. It brings destruction. So in that part of the story, you're seeing Romans 7, like, play out. Now you're going to see Romans 8, though, because you know Jesus' response, how brilliantly and lovingly words fell from his lips to the crowd. He says to them, what did he say? Yes. Yeah. Looks at them and says, whichever one of you is without sin, you can pick up the first rock and throw it. And just silences them. It was a stunning answer because he shut them up and he released grace all at the same time. He's just that good. And, um, and one by one, they start to leave. The oldest from the youngest starts to leave. And um, I think the older folks just had wisdom to get it, right? And it took the younger ones with their zeal, you know, it took them a while to like, all right, fine. But um, Jesus covers this woman with love. And, you know, it says that she was caught in the act. And I think there's a possibility that she might have been naked or at least with like, like just a sheet or something around her. So think about this. This is the garden all over again. This is Eve ashamed in the garden. And what did God do in Eden? He covered her. He covered her with a garment. It's amazing. Jesus covers this woman with love, covers her. And everybody leaves. And this is what it says at the end of the story until finally Jesus was left alone with the woman still standing there in front of him. So he stood back up and said to her, dear woman, where are your accusers? Is there no one here to condemn you? Looking around, she replied, I see no one, Lord. Jesus said, then I certainly don't condemn you either. Go, and from now on, be free from a life of sin. Beautiful. That is the book of Romans in a parable. Well, it's a real story, but there it is for us. There is no condemnation in the presence of Jesus. Jesus will never seek to damn you with the crowd or destroy you. He only came to give you life. And you have to get that part settled. Like, there's two sentences there when Jesus speaks. I don't condemn you either. And then the second sentence is, go be free from a life of sin. Before you can get the second sentence, you have to get the first sentence. Before you can get Romans 8 verse 2, law of the spirit of life has set you free from sin, all that, you have to get Romans 8 verse 1. You have to understand there's no condemnation in Christ. This is the gospel in a nutshell. So here it is, Romans 8, verses 1 and 2. You have to make this your home. You have to like set up a sanctuary in your heart of Roman stones built by the words of Romans 8, verses 1 and 2. You have to, you have to build this, this uh, a beautiful fortress in your mind of the truth of Romans 8 and let it remain, abide there, abide in that place. It's the only place that can protect you from the storms of this world. It's the only place that can protect you from a world that clings so desperately to law and to fear, okay? And when you get the first part, you are empowered to get the second part, which is go and be free. Be free from sin and death because it's not your identity anyway. But you got to get that love first. That love is what heals you into who you truly are. That forgiveness always comes first. Okay. So I am going to jump to verse 14 of Romans 8, okay? And the reason I'm jumping to verse 14 is because everything from Romans 8, 3 to 13 um, is going to get summed up in verse 14, okay? So we're going to move forward. Next, next point here. 
Romans 8, 3 through 13 is a, is a portion of the scripture that focuses on walking in the spirit, living by the spirit. It's all about living, living by the spirit of God. And um, there's so much we could unpack. I wish we had more time with it, but, but everything that we need to say is really, is, is so beautifully summarized in verse, verses 14, 15, and 16. So I'm going to read this from the Passion again, Passion Translation, and uh, I just want you to listen with your heart as well as your mind, okay? So verse 14, the mature children of God are those who are moved by the impulses of the Holy Spirit. And you did not receive the spirit of religious duty. Do you know what he's doing there? He's going back to what he just taught them in Romans 7, saying that mindset, Romans 7, I, the things I don't want to do, I don't do, wretched man that I am, that's the spirit of religious duty. You did not receive that though which leads you back into the fear of never being good enough. You have received the spirit of full acceptance, enfolding you into the family of God. And you will never feel orphaned, for as he rises up within us, our spirits join him in saying the words of tender affection, Beloved Father, for the Holy Spirit makes God's fatherhood real to us as he whispers into our innermost being, you are God's beloved child. I don't even want to preach. There's too much goodness on that alone. Just leave it there. It's beautiful. You are God's beloved child. That's what the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Okay, I will preach a little bit because I got to say something. Okay, there's like, well, here's the deal. There's like 90,000 teachings out there on walking in the Spirit. Just in the last 15 years, there's probably 90,000 teachings out there that you could get on what it means to live by the Spirit. And, you know, a lot of them are about, like, meditation or prayer or fasting or reading the Bible or controlling your thought life or your, your, your behavior, whatever. And um, that's what we hear a lot when we hear topics about what it means to walk in the Spirit, which is the focus, again, of Romans, the beginning of Romans 8. But understand that walking in the Spirit is in this context. Everything he's saying here is the crescendo of his teaching on walking in the Spirit. What I mean is that this is, this is where the river of Revelation takes us. Walking by the Spirit of God is about sonship. Okay? It's about resting in your full acceptance and never feeling orphaned. It's a consciousness. It's a mentality. It's a faith. So that woman who was caught in the act of adultery, when she heard the words, I don't condemn you, now go and be free. She got up, she stood up. She began to walk in the spirit of Jesus, literally. She was under the spirit of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, my words are spirit and life. And she received those words. You receive his word, it's life into, in, in your innermost being. There's power in it. This isn't just like happy thoughts, positive thinking, power of positive thinking. These words are spirit and life. They do something on the inside of you, right? Yeah. Just, can I go back to this lady for a second? Because it's so amazing what happened there. Like, just imagine the fear building in her before Jesus opened his mouth. I mean, he was, he was a man, like all of us, right? It says that we didn't, we didn't recognize him, you know, like in Isaiah. It says he was nothing of, of, of bold appearance that we would recognize him. I mean, he could have just been any other rabbi that was about to um, sign off on her, her judgment, her execution. But, but not only the fear that was building in her. I mean, think about the shame. This was like a complete setup for PTSD right here. This was traumatic. I mean, you have guilt mixed in with things because obviously you're, this is a shame-based culture and now you're being exposed for what you've been doing behind closed doors. 
and now it's been brought in the open, so there's guilt, and then you're being dragged into public, and then there's the fear of what's going to, I mean, you talk about a cocktail for anxiety and depression and who knows what else, right? Like, this would be horrible. And imagine then that fear washing away from her under the words that are spirit and life. I don't condemn you. Go and be free. Dear woman, woman, where that word came out of Genesis, Eve, the one who comes from man. Dear woman, affirming her original identity. Go and be free. I just can imagine the peace, the shalom that would come over her. And that's what we're called to walk in, guys. Yes. Yeah, that's what we're called to to experience, to live in, to live under this constant, we talked about this a few weeks ago, this waterfall of grace. And of course, we need the Holy Spirit to empower us. So it says the Holy Spirit makes, I love that, makes God's fatherhood real to us. You can't just like teach somebody. You need the Holy Ghost. You need the Holy Spirit. Like the Holy Spirit, you can't just try to convince someone intellectually of God's fatherhood. You can't, I mean, you, could, you can do that. You gotta do that. But you, your words have to be in partnership with the Spirit in order for those words to have an impact. The Spirit of God is the only one who can make God's fatherhood real to a person. And you might be more familiar with this translation of it. Um, this, is, this is one of my favorite verses. This is my birthday verse, 816. I love it. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. God. My birthday's August. That's what I meant by that. Um, testifies. I love that because the Holy Spirit comes to bring a testimony of somebody's true identity. This is, this is a really important point. I want to like, I want to spend a lot of time on this, but I've got to move on to the second half of Romans 8. But like, you have to understand when the Holy, when somebody receives Christ, they're born again. Okay. They don't all of a sudden become God's child. Like they weren't God's child before. They were already God's child. That's a misunderstanding of being born again, okay? Every single person is God's offspring, God's child. The Holy Spirit comes and makes it real to them, empowers them, and it is like being born anew. It is a totally new experience of life, but that person always was God's child. He didn't die for the progeny of demons, okay? Satan can create no one. Okay, we misinterpret verses like this because I just got to go here real quick just to show you because people think of this, the verses like this. It says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. So this is where we, we take this, we isolate certain verses and we say that only Christians are children of God. False, not true. That's an office uh, quote, false. Dwight says that. Not true. Only, only children, no. He gave them the right. That word right means authority or power. It's very interesting. That word right, he gave them the right to become children of God or the power really to become who they truly are. That's what what this is getting at. That word right shows up in Jesus' life only after his baptism, which is interesting because at his baptism, Jesus receives the Holy Spirit. What is that about? Does that mean that Jesus didn't have the Holy Spirit beforehand? That he wasn't a child of God? No. Jesus was always the Son of God, but the Spirit of God came upon him as a witness to testify what salvation looks like. We are all the children of God, and the Spirit, when somebody receives Christ, the Spirit comes upon them and testifies with their spirit, gives them power, authority to become who they are, to become who God made them to be. The image is re-revealed and redeemed, the image inside. Okay, so that's, that's kind of a whole other sermon. It's a whole other message, and we actually hit on that when we went through Ephesians two years ago, two or three years ago. I forget when it was. So you can go back to the Ephesians series and, and learn a little bit more about that, about the word adoption and what that word adoption really means. Um, but I got to keep going here um, because this is what brings us to, like, the, the, the peak, okay, the mountain peak of, uh, of Everest in scripture, the second half of Romans 8. So there are things in Romans 8 that are beyond comprehension. 
and um, I'm, I'm like, I'm about to say some stuff to you. <laughs> and um, as I speak, like there's going to be angels like looking at the word of God, looking into us like in awe and rapture. Like just, and some of you are going to hear it and it's going to be like, Phew. but that's okay because we're learning. And we're praying for the grace, the capacity to receive revelation, to receive the fullness of this truth. Because when you truly start to receive this, like, you're, you're, you would be crawling out of here if it, if it, if it hits you. You would be. You would be crawling out of here if this really hits you. So get ready. Some of you might hit the, hit the deck. It's okay. Come on. Okay. <laughs> I'm so serious right now. I'm happily serious. Like, um, the revelation in Romans 8, the second half that we're going into right now, is just, it's, it's from another realm. And I'm just gonna pray again that God gives us the grace to receive it. And you know what some of us need to do? Some of you need to pray that God would remove any control issues if Holy Spirit wants to come over your life. Okay, because some of you get nervous when you hear the idea of crawling out of church. I don't want to crawl out of church. Well, listen, <laughs> I'm sure the Israelites under the cloud of glory didn't want to crawl off the mountain, but you know, it happens in the presence of God. It's okay. God will never lead you into anything that is unsafe. He will never do anything to harm you or embarrass you. He's so good. He's so good. So you have to understand that when you open your heart up to the Holy Spirit for God to do what he wants to do in your life, you have to understand that whatever he wants to do is going to be good and wholesome, even if it looks a little strange sometimes, okay? Let's just do that right now. Let's give him permission. I, I, I want to like actually prepare for the ascent, okay? We're still at the base camp here. We're about to go up, and I want to prepare our heart for a moment. So Father, I pray that you eliminate any fear Anything that keeps us from receiving, God, all of the revelation that you're pouring out in this season. And you just pray this to the Lord in, in your heart. Like, Jesus, I surrender control to you. I surrender control. I surrender control. Father, help me. Holy Spirit, make God's fatherhood real to me. That he's a good dad who would never do anything to hurt me. Holy Spirit, make God's fatherhood real that we would trust and let go and fully take in the revelation of heaven that is pouring out to the earth right now. Amen. Okay, you ready to go up? Got your oxygen tanks and your uh, walking sticks? Your boots. This is the next verse of Romans 8. Okay? Just, you're warned. Okay. Since we are his true children, <clears throat> present tense, we qualify to share all his treasures. For indeed, we are heirs of God himself. And since we are joined to Christ, we also inherit all that he is and all that he has. <laughs> um, let me pause for a second. We inherit all that he is and all that he has. And we will experience being co-glorified with him, provided that we accept his sufferings as our own. Now, I love that. I love this translation because, um, because when he talks about accepting Jesus' sufferings as our own, that's going back to Romans 6. It's, it's, it's seeing it in context. We were co-crucified. We co-suffered with Jesus 
on the cross. So, so this is about identifying with his suffering for us, that we already died. We already died. Here's why that's important, because you can read this in other translations and miss the context. Um, we, your suffering doesn't make you holy. His suffering made you holy. Okay? His suffering empowers you to rise up through any suffering that you go through on earth. That's an important distinction because a lot of people think that suffering is a requirement to be holy. Okay, no, suffering comes on the holy and the unholy. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. There are people who don't know Jesus, have rejected Jesus, that have experienced more suffering than you can imagine. Okay? This is about identifying with his suffering. This is the narrow path, a path so narrow that only one person could fit through, and it was the Son of God. And the only way you get through is by realizing that you're in union with him. That's the narrow path, folks. The narrow path is not your personal discipline and suffering. The narrow path is Jesus Christ crucified and you being in union with him, receiving his sufferings as your own. Okay? You guys following along? Breathe deeply. The air is thinner up here. Okay. So, of course, God uses suffering to awaken us, to build us, all of that stuff. I know. But this is about identifying with him. But look at what it says next. Here, here's, here's where, okay, we're, we're, this is the top, I, I believe. This is like the peak, this next verse. If that wasn't enough, verse 18, 19, 20, 21. I am convinced that any suffering we endure is less than nothing compared to the magnitude of glory that is about to be unveiled within us. The entire universe is standing on tiptoe yearning to see the unveiling of God's glorious sons and daughters. <laughs> the entire universe is standing on tiptoe, yearning to see the unveiling of God's glorious sons and daughters. All right, so give it to me in the King James Version. The earth is groaning for the manifestation of the sons of God. For against its will, the universe itself has had to endure the empty futility resulting from the consequences of human sin. But now, with eager expectation... All creation longs for freedom from its slavery to decay and to experience with us the wonderful freedom coming to God's children. Do you realize what's being said there? It's a lot, okay? It's a lot. First of all, we're not waiting for the glory to come down, really. We're waiting for the glory to come out. Glory's already inside of us, okay? What we're waiting on, and in fact, here's an amazing secret, all creation is waiting. Creation is waiting for this as well. What we're waiting on is for what's already inside of us to be unveiled. There's going to be a people who so allow the gospel to crack open their skulls that so allow Romans chapter 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 to open up their mind and heart that the glory of God from within them is going to erupt like a volcano. They're going to be unstoppable. Unstoppable. More than conquerors. Mm, jumping ahead of myself. And as that happens, creation is going to change. You want a solution to climate change? It's the church waking up to the gospel. That's what's going to do it. Look, we got to be stewards of the earth too. Absolutely. But our stewardship is going to get Holy Ghost firepower in it when we realize fully who we are. Yeah. Oh, it's going to change creation itself. Do these things seem too fantastic to you? What if God raises someone from the dead? That's what Paul said to a group of people who were just looking at him like, does this seem crazy to you? Hmm. So here's the deal. 
Here's where we get to the, uh, the theme and the focus here. That word unveiling is really important. And if you are a student in our school of awakening, you will have already learned this and we've gotten into this in, in a lot of depth. But that word unveiling is the same word that is used in the book of Revelation for the apocalypse. Okay, I gotta, I, you gotta give me just a few minutes on this. Apocalypto in the Greek. It's the word used for apocalypse in Revelation when John receives a, an apocalypse from the Lord, the apocalypse of Jesus Christ. It says in the same language, the same terminology, the same word, Paul, they just translate it differently. It says that the universe is yearning to see the apocalypse of God's sons and daughters because that word apocalypto means an unveiling. It's like when the bride takes the veil off, you see her face. That's what the word means. We have misinterpreted the apocalypse through a lens of law and fear, okay? Through that spirit of fear, we have painted out the apocalypse to be about something that it's really not, and through misinterpreting the meaning of the book of Revelation. Again, another whole other sermon, multiple sermons. The apocalypse is ultimately about the glory of God manifesting in the church. And you know what? Creation is actually looking forward to it. There's this verse in Chronicles. I love it. It says that the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. The trees sing for joy because God is coming to judge the earth. Now, if you think that the apocalypse is when the trees of the earth burn, a third of the, of the wildlife, it says in Revelation, burned, if you see that literally, literalistically, okay, then that's not something they would sing for joy for. But it says creation is actually rejoicing for his judgment to come. You know, his judgment is his mercy and it's his righteous reign through his church. The judgment of God is his justice and righteousness flowing through us. His kingdom is coming through us. Jesus said the kingdom is within you. And guess what? This is already happening to some extent. You know, the person who just won the Nobel Peace Prize is a spirit-filled Pentecostal African. Prime minister of Ethiopia. He prays in tongues every day, goes to a Bible study. He, he, he worked out an agreement between his nation and another nation, ending strife that had existed for a very long time. Just won the Nobel Peace Prize. That is the judgment of the Lord coming upon the nation through the spirit, the river of God, and a man who's just believing in who he is a little bit. Yeah, just a little bit. It's already happening. And it's going to increase. It's going to accelerate. And I know some of you aren't even ready to hear this, but I have to go on the record with this Roman series because it's really important. I got a word that this Roman series was gonna go way beyond this church, and I wanna make sure I don't just bypass this word here. I, gotta, I wanna just make it very clear that the real apocalypse is an awakening of identity that's gonna be so real in people's hearts that it's going to bring about a manifestation of Christ on the earth, that they'll be saying like they did in Antioch 2,000 years ago, there are little Christs over there. Little Christs over there. Little Christ over there doing the works of Jesus. It will be heard in the streets. That's the apocalypse. Creation is not groaning for the physical return of Jesus. According to that scripture. Don't get mad at me. I believe in the physical return of Jesus. I want to make, put that on the record. I believe in the physical return of the Lord. But there is something they're waiting for that, that precipitates that, that leads into that which are the sons and daughters of God rising up, the bride being unveiled. That's what Romans 8 is getting to. That's what the gospel leads to. This isn't just learning theology. This is learning our roadmap into the destiny of the universe. <laughs> and in other news, it's snowing outside. <laughs> How deep does it go? 
How deep does the rabbit hole go? <sighs> All right, listen, I'm gonna call the worship team back up. Can we do that? I'm gonna, we're gonna actually read. Listen, we're not done. We're not done. We're just shifting our focus. We're just preparing our heart to receive something right now. I want the worship team to actually play as I finish up because I want you to, I want you to hear this, but I want you to hear it from a, from a place of worship, a place of receiving. So um, we're on the peak. We're on the peak of the mountain, and um, we're going to read through the end together. We're going to get a full landscape of the gospel here. I love the end of Romans 8. It's amazing. This is Paul wrapping everything up. He's summing everything up so beautifully. Now, of course, you know Romans isn't over. So there's a trail on the other side of the mountain, which is Romans 9 through 16. We're going to go down that trail. That's going to take us right into 2020. So we will be doing that. But we're right now, Romans 8 is the peak. It is the mountaintop. There's more things to learn on the trail, but we're at the pinnacle here. And we're going to look around and we're going to behold some beautiful vistas of the glory of God. Now, I'm going to jump down to verse 28. I'm passing over some verses um, that I, I just, for sake of time, but um, these verses are about God helping you in your weakness, okay? When you feel a million miles away from being the manifest son or daughter of God, it says the Holy Spirit helps you in your weakness, helps you to pray. And even when things don't look like they're working out in your life, God is working out all things for good. That's actually where I'm going to pick up, Romans 8, verse 28. So I'm going to read this to you, and I want you to just, I'm going to put it on the screen. So if you want to read along, you can, but if you want to close your eyes right now, you can do that too, and just, just breathe, okay? Just breathe, just allow the Lord to speak to your heart. I want to show you some beautiful things right now. So let him open the eyes of your heart as we as we read this together. So, we are convinced that every detail of our lives is continually woven together to fit into God's perfect plan of bringing good into our lives. For we are his lovers who have been called to fulfill his design purpose. For he knew all about us before we were born and he destined us from the beginning to share the likeness of his son. This means the son is the oldest among a vast family of brothers and sisters who will become just like him. Okay, I gotta read that one more time. He knew all about us before we were born and he destined us from the beginning to share the likeness of his son. This means the son is the oldest among a vast family of brothers and sisters who will become just like him. Having determined our destiny ahead of time, he called us to himself. And he transferred his perfect righteousness to everyone he called. See, he's summing up this beautiful gospel. And those who possess his perfect righteousness, he co-glorified with his son. Wow, we're actually already glorified with Jesus. It hasn't been revealed. It hasn't been unveiled. But there's glory behind that veil. So what does all this mean? If God has determined to stand with us, tell me who then could ever stand against us? For God has proved his love by giving us his greatest treasure, the gift of his son. And since God freely offered him up as the sacrifice for us all, he certainly won't withhold anything from us, anything else he has to give. Who then would dare to accuse those whom God has chosen in love to be his? God himself is the judge. Who has issued the final verdict over them? Not guilty. No condemnation. Who then is left to condemn us? Do you hear the words of Jesus? He said that to the woman. 
Where are your accusers? He's saying this to you right now. Who then is left to condemn us? Certainly not Jesus, the anointed one. For he gave his life for us. And even more than that, he has conquered death and is now risen, exalted, and enthroned by God at his right hand. So how could he possibly condemn us since he is continually praying for our triumph? What? Who could ever separate us from the endless love of God's anointed one? Absolutely no one. For nothing in the universe has the power to diminish his love towards us. Troubles, pressures, and problems are unable to come between us and heaven's love. <laughs> what about persecutions, deprivations, dangers, and death threats? No, for they are all impotent to hinder omnipotent love. Even though it is written all day long, we face death threats for your sake, God. We are considered to be nothing more than sheep to be slaughtered. Yet in the midst of all these things, we triumph over them all. For God has made us to be more than conquerors. And his demonstrated love is our glorious victory over everything. That's an important statement. His demonstrated love. What's that talking about? That's the display, the propitiation, the cross. The demonstrated love revealed at the cross is your victory over everything. There's nothing that could ever stand in the power of Jesus Christ, God the Son, dying for you, giving his life for you, giving everything for you. Nothing, nothing can stand in the face of that. So now, I live with the confidence. This is what you're going into the next decade with, okay? This is going to be your speech. This is going to be what resonates from the depths of your being in this next season of your life. So now I live with the confidence that there is nothing in the universe with the power to separate us from God's love. I'm convinced that his love will triumph over death, life's troubles, fallen angels, or dark rulers in the heavens. There is nothing in our present or future circumstances that can weaken his love. There is no power above us or beneath us, no power that could ever be found in the universe that can distance us from God's passionate love, which is lavished upon us through our Lord Jesus, the anointed one. Let's stand up together. Thank you, Lord. We praise you for your word. We praise you for the glories and the wonders of your word. And we say yes. We say yes and amen. We love you, Jesus.